alive, you are alive. Good afternoon, good afternoon everybody and welcome to the wilds of the Kruger National Park. Now for many of you, you know what's going on here, of course you are regular viewers and it is marvellous to have you along. But as a result of Big Cat Week there are lots of new viewers and it's so great to have you too. Please remember you are on a live safari here on the Sunset Drive in, with Safari Live, that rhymes of course beautifully, uh, in the northern reaches of the, well, western reaches of the Kruger National Park, northeastern South Africa southern tip of the African continent. It's wonderful to have you with us. Please ask us questions as we go along. Send us your comments. Hashtag Safari Live if you're tweeting like the uh, white browed scrub robin just behind us or questions at wildearth.tv if you'd like to email us. My name is James Henry. On camera we've got Tebs. That's his thumb there. And on the other vehicle is Scott, and he's being filmed by the diminutive but highly competent VM Dornbrach. And you'll be happy to know the drone commander, Andrew Francis, is lurking about the reserve somewhere to show you some of the incredible aerial shots that we have of this magnificent reserve. Just before we get going, just off to the my left-hand side, your right-hand side, is a beautiful little herd of Nyala. And that is a female cow next to her a sub-adult cow and i think there was a young bull in there somewhere as well my favorite antelope there's a young bull coming through now now that young bull you can see his his hair color is starting to change slightly and he will eventually turn into a charcoal gray just a glorious afternoon sitting at about 29 degrees celsius or 85 degrees fahrenheit if you happen to work in that tremendously complex imperial system and our plan this afternoon is to head from here off to Bifflesfoot dam where we'll have a look what's going on there the water is drying up yet again and while many are saying that this is a drought i wouldn't say we've got quite that far yet certainly we're standing on the precipice of what i think is might be quite a severe drought and that's as a result of apparently the uh, weather boffins tell me if you can actually have a weather boffin given the mm, success that the predictions of the, that they have i'm not sure weather boffin is in fact a real thing but they tell us that el nino which is a weather phenomenon is going to make this a very dry year indeed so as a result of the dry year we had yesterday and the dry year this year i think we may well be in for a drought at the moment not too bad there's still water around the place that little bit of rain that we have had has left little pans of water in the blocks so wherever there's a bit of clay it's managed to hold some of the water the dams are definitely very empty though right without further ado enough waffling from me let's carry on Scott has got something very exciting to show you. I'm going to head off to the dam and see you just now. Hello, everyone. And it's great to have you on board. That is a vulture. And vultures are notorious for flying in and around areas where there may be a carcass or a kill. And it's... A huge thanks to these birds because when we were out this morning between drives on a little bit of an exploration mission in search of any action we saw many vultures plummeting out of the sky into the area where we are currently parked right now and we drove in couldn't see anything on first inspection but then took a short walk around managed to find a carcass as well as the animal that performed the scene or performed the crime and what we're going to do is we're about to show you exactly what was caught and killed and by who what's interesting now and i'm gonna point out more as we go along is that it appears that most of the vultures that were in this area earlier this morning have actually moved off. So as we drove here this afternoon, there wasn't nearly as much clues and signals as there were at about 8.30 or 9 o'clock this morning when we came out. 
And obviously the vultures have realized that they'd rather move off in search of another kill or carcass that is not going to be protected by the animal that made it. My name is Scott, for those of you who have not met me before, and I'm teamed up with VM on camera today. As we drive over a lot of these small bushes, don't worry, they're going to pop straight back up behind us, and we know which trees can tolerate a little bit of a beating and others that cannot, and we avoid the ones that cannot be driven over. And that's evident because as you look around us, even though there's a lot of off-roading done in the Savi Sands, there's no clear evidence that the plants are taking any damage, even during the drought that we are currently in. Now keep your eyes peeled. I'm not too sure where this predator is. I know where the kill is, but as we're driving through here, keep your eyes peeled. There is a stealthy predator in and around us. This dead tree up to my right here was absolutely full with vultures. This morning there was even a lapid-faced vulture here. And I'm hugely disappointed that they've all left because we don't get to show you vultures as much as I'd like to. But I guess it's good news for the predator. Gonna have less of a hard time. And it's also gonna mean that other predators are not going to be attracted to this area. Even predators who do not make a kill may, from time to time, respond to vultures that are dropping out of the sky and look for an easy meal. I was hoping to get into a shady spot, but I don't think that's going to work out. Now, keep scanning very carefully. Some of you may have noticed something already, but what I'm going to show you first is something straight ahead of us. And we've probably already got a glimpse of this carcass. It's a female kudu. A bit of a sad story here. And even though death is a requirement out here for some animals to eat, this female kudu was about to give birth to a tiny little foal. And the predator responsible for catching her and killing her has opened up her stomach and pulled that fetus out. And It'll be interesting to hear who you think is responsible for making this kill. So send through any guesses you would like very quickly to questions at wildearth.tv or hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. And we are going to wait until you tell us who this animal is, or what kind of animal this is. You can be as specific as the name of this animal. The leopards of this area, if it is a leopard, have got individual names. The lion coalitions and lion prides have also got uh, a certain name. So, oh, we're in luck, and it looks like we are in for an absolute treat. I didn't expect this. And you can all thank the quarantine male leopard for getting up unexpectedly in the heat of the day and coming across to this carcass. It looks like he may feed on it. He hasn't fed on it since this morning, since we were here. So our timing is incredibly, incredibly lucky. Michelle and I think Gracia have both guessed leopard before we even got you, so well done. Oh, looks like the flies are giving him a hard time. Oh, look at all those flies. Oh. Look at his strength now. That is probably about 300 pounds of kudu, and he's probably maximum about 180, 160 to 180 pounds of leopard. And he's dragging almost double his body weight there. Now, what's interesting is that he dragged the small fetus away from this area, probably about 100 meters away, down into a riverbed below us. We, weren't sh we couldn't follow exactly where he went. We were sadly not in the small little vehicles that we use 
for broadcast and we're in a much longer limousine which is very hard to negotiate off-road so we decided to leave him and head down into the riverbed but he does have another little stash there as well as all this meat here now for him to be able to hoist this kill up into a tree i don't think is possible it's twice his body weight and very very tricky for him to get that wedged into the fork of a tree at the moment if he manages to feed on it a bit more uninterrupted oh there goes some stomach contents and he's going to probably feed on it like a little piece of spaghetti sliding it through his front teeth no let's chomp that bit off as i was saying though if he does manage to feed on it for a kind of 24 more hours then he's got a chance of getting it up into a tree but the likelihood of him being uninterrupted in the next 24 hours is very very slim either lion or hyena will come into this area and he will give way to both of them And Polo on YouTube, spot on. This is certainly a very large meal for one leopard. And if he was interrupted, this would be food for easily five full days. And he would stay here for five full days, even though by the end of it, there would certainly be one or two maggots jiggling about the carcass. But it wasn't long ago that his mother, a female leopard called Karula, fed on a female and adult grown impala for five nights in total so a nice big meal but what an all likelihood is going to happen here look at how he's removing the stomach content there sliding the stomach lining between his front teeth flies are giving him a real hard time there imagine having all those flies buzzing around you while you eat your tasty kudu there's another great display of his strength not easy because there's a lot of vegetation below him small plants that are preventing that kudu to move further into the shade which he's trying to do for a couple of reasons to keep it cool as well as to keep it out of view of animals like vultures hello to sleepy one on youtube and really enjoying all the new viewers who are watching on youtube and all the different platforms that you can watch and it's important to know that there are different platforms where you can watch these safari so if one is giving you a bit of hard time it's worthwhile trying a different one as it may be a little bit better depending on what country you're in and oh look at this And yes, this leopard certainly does have a name. His name is Mr. Q or Quarantine. And that's for you, sleepy one, watching on YouTube. Thank you very much for sending your question through. And all the leopard of the Sabi Sands are named. He's named after an area. And quite often leopards are named after areas. Sometimes they're named after traits, whether they skittish or nervous or sneaky or move big distances there's various ways that animals will be named but all of the leopards in the sabi sands are named and it's not because we feel like they are our pets but it's just from a work perspective it's good to know who's who who moves where keeping track of lineage knowing who his mother is knowing who his likely father is judging by the dominant male in the area when his mother gives birth or sometimes you even get to see a female mating with several males which is actually often the case and that's why we can never be certain who the father is because female leopards will often mate with more than one male during one estrus cycle and i'm told that from one litter where a female may produce two cubs each cub may have a different father fascinating stuff but apparently that is actually the case a 
okay, well, there's a few vehicles getting active now. Oh, we can smell that now. The wind's blowing straight towards us. Not very good, but I'm going to have to get onto the radio quickly to update Taxon, who's just got out with his guests on where about we are. Tax, come along Leadwood until you see a Gwari branch. We're about midway along Leadwood. Uh, between Drakensberg and Gauri, Main, You'll see the Gwari branch and I'm west of that, so I'll also get your audio. Okay, well that's that little bit of admin out the way. Apologies for that, but imperative that we keep good relationships with all the guides. It could very well be that we were heading out this afternoon with no plans. Oh, look at his claws there. Awesome. And you can see the sheath where they are usually protected and kept sharp and it's only when they're climbing up trees or latching onto prey that they protract those claws out and this is an awesome awesome visual what we may be able to do later is try and reposition the vehicle there was a whole big bunch of scratch marks in and around this kudu's neck and it must have been an almighty wrestling match between this big male leopard. We are in, we are getting a seriously awesome show here, everyone. If this is your first live safari, I would like you to do two things. I'd like you to realize how lucky we are and how lucky you are to be getting off to such a great start and also to let us know who you are and where you're watching. Always good to know there's new people on board and we can chat with you. That is the beauty of these live interactive safaris. to Shell in Detroit and to Noah who's watching on YouTube and you guys would both like to know how old is this leopard and like I was saying earlier we don't only know their names and often their lineage but also their age and he was basically born almost this time three years ago so a three-year-old male which makes him independent not quite fully grown he's as tall as he will become in all likelihood but his body is going to fill out, his head is going to become a bit bigger. There's certainly room for a lot more growth and he'll probably only be in his prime at about five years of age to seven years of age and could live for up to 15 years, possibly even a little bit longer than that. So he's a youngster and we've been very, very fortunate in being able to watch him and his brother called Konyuma quite closely since we arrived here this time last year. And it was him and his brother Konyuma that we definitely spent more time with in our first six months of Safari Live than any other two leopards. We also haven't seen him for quite a long time, so great to have him back on the property. We watch him feeding on the ground here, wondering what the outcome of this kill is going to be. Will he be able to get it up to a tree at some point? Shrub on Twitter has asked, what is the heaviest weight that a male leopard has hoisted up into a tree? And sadly, Shrub, it's so difficult to have accurate weights on all of these things because they're wild animals. And to be able to have an exact measurement or exact weight would understandably be tricky without getting in the way of the animals and interfering too much. But I've heard tales of fully grown baby, well, a baby giraffe, obviously fully grown and born, being hoisted up into trees and those will weigh possibly upwards of 100 kilograms. Young zebra foals have also been caught and put up into trees. I've never heard of a kudu being put into a tree, not at least a, a, an adult, by a big male leopard, but 200 pounds, their own body weight, is easily, easily achievable. 
often slightly more. And that same goes for a female. So a 100-pound female would be able to probably hoist 200 pounds worth of animal up into a tree. There's no guarantees, and it will depend on the individual. Looks like he's finished a snack for now. And we were so, so fortunate that we got to see him feeding now. It was the last thing I expected him to do. It's very, very hot. And I thought closer to about 6.30 this evening we'd see him take his first mouthful. But that is the joy. What a beautiful shot this is through the foliage. And that is the joy of being on a live safari. You simply do not know what is going to happen and when. Even though there are likely outcomes and likely things to happen, this is a great example of simply not knowing what is going to happen next. So, Shrub, back to your question. Anything up to their weight and in upwards of that, ever so slightly, they can get up into trees. I guess would be the final answer. Okay, well, good news. You guys are going to be teleported across to a bit of a fun and exciting times across at Buffelzook Waterhole. Put your seat belts on and be ready to be taken up to some altitude. We aren't going to go anywhere and you'll be back with us shortly. I don't know about exciting, but certainly interesting times at Buffalo's Hook Dam. Thank you, Scott. Uh, you can see seven buffalo bulls there that are enjoying this last of the mud that is here at Buffalo's Hook Dam. Now, this dam has not dried up in 20 years' time. And you can see that it is on the verge of drying up. And every time it looks like it's about to go dry, we get a little smattering of rain and the puddles refill and that green, greasy water there maintains. So the buffalo bulls, not too concerned about being in the water today. It's only been about, like we said, 29 degrees Far uh, Celsius, not Fahrenheit, uh, which is nine, eight, 85 degrees Fahrenheit, and so not too hot for them. They're normally, at this time of the year, used to much, much hotter temperatures into the hundreds of Fahrenheit. It's normally 102, 103 around there. So they just like to come down to the water. They'll happily drink that water. They'll also go to the loo in it, which is just utterly disgusting, but that's how they operate, and that doesn't seem to affect them at all. They'll also lie down in it and snooze, and just to maintain the kind of coolth of the way the coolth of the day. Now, what you can see, a very great treat, the drone commander, Andrew Francis, you can see how much this has dried out and how the extent of the dam, which you don't necessarily get from a, a look from the vehicle, you can see the extent of it, but you can also see the greenery. And, well, I'm always aston astonished at how much less green it looks from the air than it does from the vehicle. So from the vehicle, we're only driving through the woodlands. All the trees are bright green, and it looks like everything is verdant and almost tropical. When you get into the air like you are now, you can see how it's not the case. Uh, the trees don't look nearly as thick, and you can also see in between the trees pretty brown, gray stuff. Not a lot of grass in there at the moment. Uh, lots and lots of sort of weedy stuff and huge gaps between the grass plants which is not great for the grazers and if the dry conditions persist we're going to have very little grass for the grazers to eat and you can see this huge dam uh, seems like a bit of overkill for this time of the year especially without the rain and it's hard to imagine this dam being sort of well I guess 10 feet deep at the center at some stages so that is quite interesting Right, so a totally different perspective now that you've come back to us on the vehicle and you can see how much greener it possibly looks uh, into the woodland. I'm always amazed at the difference and it certainly doesn't feel quite as green uh, down on the ground as I think it looks to you. Uh, other interesting things at the dam here, we've got a grey heron, which is the large sort of tall bird there which we'll zoom into now. And he will be looking for frogs and possibly the odd tilapia to eat. The tilapia had a mass die-off a little while back. As a result, I suspect, of two things. One, the heat of the very shallow water, and also all of that algae would have sucked the oxygen out of the water, which would have meant that the fish had nothing to drink at all.
Thank you, John, for your question on uh, Twitter. <laughs> you want to know what is more dangerous, a lion, a leopard, or Brent Leo Smith's boots? Um, there's absolutely no question as to what is the most dangerous of those. Uh, Brent Leo Smith's boots are by far the most dangerous things in the world. They, in fact, are, have been banned in many countries. Uh, Brent, has to, Brent is not allowed by international law to travel with his shoes on. He acts, has to travel in special sanitized socks. Um, in, serious th in seriousness, though, John, it's actually quite an interesting question because just the whole concept of danger out here is such a big thing, and people often convinced that uh, we are taking our lives in our hands by driving around with a camera here and that we might be set upon by prides of lions around every corner and leopards might leap on and eat tebs off the back of the vehicle, the buffalo might turn the vehicle over, the elephants might charge us, the hippo might bite us with their great big canine. It's just not like that. We're in a magnificent wilderness area. Yes, it's potentially dangerous in some ways, of course, and I've said this before, but to our new viewers, it's particularly important for you to understand. This is not an inherently dangerous place to be. It's more dangerous walking down a street in New York City, I believe, than it is going for a walk here, as long as you understand how animals are going to react to you on foot. And so that's very crucial. Um, Tebs seems to have spotted something. Tebs, oh, brilliant. Tebs, you've got a woodland kingfisher there. Well done. Now, Pamela, while we're looking at that woodland kingfisher, um, you say the water looks very ew. It is very ew. Pamela, I wouldn't drink it, especially not after I just watched the buffalo, um, well, relieve himself of all forms of waste product into it. I'm sure it's pretty disgusting, and that's why the algal bloom has occurred. Right, let us head it back across to the leopard. Uh, enough talk of this sort of toilet humour, and we will see you a little bit later. So, it seems like he's eventually found a... Nice shady spot here though, as you can see he is panting and it's a very hot afternoon, thankfully quite a cool breeze blowing but he's very low to the ground there and the what little vegetation there is has somewhat of, of a blanketing effect on him. He's also doing a bit of grooming as you can see and isn't it incredible how they camouflage and blend in so well to their surroundings as VM zoomed out there. I hope you enjoyed your flight around Buffleshook Waterhole with James and our drone squadron commander Andrew Francis who was piloting the drone. We had some great fun with all of the vultures that helped us to find this leopard and the kill this morning. And they were all circling up above us and Andrew managed to get the drone in and amongst them and got some incredibly wonderful shots that are unique as usually you are looking high up into the sky towards the vultures, but this time you were literally in and amongst them and often looking down on them. And for those of you who haven't had a look at Andrew's wonderful videos that he's put together, it's worth checking out and having a look for them. He's done a number of different drone videos. Beam's just pointing out where the kill is in relation to where the leopard is sleeping. And in terms of distance, it's about... 20 meters, so not far away at all, and it makes sense for him to stay close by to try and protect it from any intruders, possibly other leopard, but mainly the vultures is one of the main things he'll stand up to. Lion and hyena he will stand down to, even one single hyena he will typically probably give in to, but there are always unique circumstances and occasionally male leopards will attack hyena. Jeff Top and you've tuned in late so I'm not sure if we are going to punish you by being late for being late by not answering your question about what carcass this is we may make you wait until a little bit later on until quarantine resumes feeding on it only joking Jeff 
it is a female kudu. And for any of you who may have also j t tuned in recently, this female kudu was sadly about to give birth to a tiny little kudu foal or lamb. And that was plucked out of the kudu. We could tell because usually leopard will feed on the rear end as it did start to do in this case, but it did break open the stomach and we saw it dragging the young kudu away this morning that it's stashed elsewhere. We're not sure exactly where it's stashed, but we've got a vague idea of the direction the leopard went in down towards the riverbed. And that poor little kudu's big ears hadn't even hardened yet. They were very soft and floppy and was probably going to be born in just a few days. It's not uncommon at this time of the year for heavily pregnant female uh, kudu as well as impala to be caught out by a leopard. Understandably, they are a little bit heavier than normal and they are preoccupied by the process of giving birth in the near future. So there's a lot on their mind and obviously they become good victims for animals like leopard. One of those things and it is essential for this leopard to survive to make kills and sadly in this case it was a female kudu that was about to give birth. I mean where is the leopard now? Ah there it is. Okay. Hello Sean and Secunda and you would like to know how far away are the hyenas from this kill? Well, the hyena den sites uh, that we know of um, are probably about a mile, a mile and a half to two miles as the crow flies from here. So not very far, but we don't know if there are any other hyena just lurking about sleeping in a riverbed nearby that could catch wind of this kudu. Like I said, it is a windy afternoon, so this scent will be getting carried far and wide. Also, what we need to remember, and I touched on it this morning, is that we do need to remember that only though, only the, the fact that we only see Juma and Arethusa does not mean that there is not life outside of Juma and Arethusa. And we are, in fact, it's in fact inverted. The majority of life is outside of Juma and Arethusa, and we are the tiny pinprick. So there could be many hyena on the surrounding properties. We are very close to our south eastern border of Juma and what I'd like to do is actually get out a quick map and be able to show you exactly where we are and that way you'll know what's what <clears throat> and I can explain a little bit better and what I mean so if I can ask VM to just pan across onto my camera uh, my cell phone um, this map shows the entire traversing area of wild earth and safari live the block on the right here the top right hand block is juma the right hand block over here is arethusa okay so it's funny kind of connection and boundary between arethusa and juma this is the funny strip of sibambili that i've spoken about before so our northern boundary kind of animals can cross straight across from our north western corner into Sibambili where we cannot follow them but if they then came further south into Arethusa we can follow them so everywhere that is green we cannot go but life still exists there and animals can move there and if you can see where we are here we are the blue dots right in the southeastern corner of our property and I'm going to zoom in a little bit just so you can see some of the road dames you are currently up over there with James northeastern corner and because we don't know what goes on to the right, to the east, and to the south, it means that there could be hyena den sites, there could be lions, there could be pterodactyls, there could be anything happening there, but we are not going to know exactly what is going on. So that will probably help answer your question as to the hyenas, our hyenas that we know being quite far away, but there could be other ones nearby, Sean. I hope you enjoyed that little map thing. We should probably do that more often to show you guys exactly what's happening. I can hear Tax making his way in, which is the good news. I'm just going to let him know where the leopard is in relation to my vehicle quickly. Tax, the kudu is about 20 meters to my left, and the ingwe is about 10 meters to my left underneath the Pulsar Forum. Uh, 
Okay, very good. So now I've given Tax an update. Like I said, he was going to be making his way here. And I'm just going to reverse an inch or two just so you've got a slightly better view of his face. Oh, that's not reverse. That's forward. There we go. Shell asks a very good question, and happy to have you on board with us, Shell. Why does he lie so far away from his kill if he is in fact protecting it? And it's probably to stay away from the flies, Shell. Um, there's going to be a lot of flies attracted to that kill, and leopards don't like flies. You can even see now he's twitching his head from side to side because flies are bothering him. Um, you get little flies you'll see some possibly on his ears i think i can see one or two. Oh, well there's one right on his nose but a lot of these flies are biting flies and obviously that's painful and not much fun but shell do not fear an animal of a leopard's speed and agility will be able to cover 20 meters in under a second so his response time to that carcass is going to be very, very quick if, in fact, he does need to get there. Hello to Scott Burns, the wonderful name you have, watching on YouTube. And you're right, this is a remarkable sighting, and aren't we privileged to be here sharing this with one another? Scott's interested to know how long will he hang on to this kudu for? And Scott, it all depends on luck. If in an ideal world, no hyena or lion give him a hard time, or in that fact, even his father, a big male leopard, who's about 12, I think 10 years old now, called him Vula, um, unless they come and give him a hard time and chase him off his kill, he could very well have enough food for five days here, very easily. In reality, what will happen, only time will tell. He could have this kill stolen from him by a clan of hyena tonight, and then all that he'll have left is the small fetus that he has stashed away down in a riverbed nearby. But certainly easily five days, if uninterrupted. Which would be wonderful for us, because... It would mean we will all be watching Leopard for the next five days with no racing about and pulling out of hair whilst trying to track these elusive and hard to find animals down. What's very important to understand is the amount of luck that goes into finding these animals combined with skill is quite scary. I mean, this morning we headed out at about nine o'clock and we were just coming out on a drive just to see what we could see no major goals or ambitions and we saw about four or five vultures plummeting out of the sky not too many and as they plummeted out of the sky we raced into the area and we noticed that already many many more vultures had already landed predominantly white-backed vultures but even one lappet faced vulture the heavyweight boxer of all the the vultures is the top of the vulture food chain and they obviously established that this leopard is not going to give them half a chance to actually come down and feed on the kill. So they've all moved off elsewhere in the hope that they will be able to find a carcass that they are allowed to feed on. But as we headed here this afternoon, absolutely no sign of any vultures. And without vultures, it would have been incredibly difficult to find them. And Debbie in Florida, like I've just said, the reason why those vultures would have left the carcass is because they've done the maths. They've come here, they've assessed the situation. Obviously, the tricky thing for a vulture, now imagine the first vulture that saw this kudu would have been like, awesome, let me come down and see what's going on. So it came down. 
Now, vultures can see incredibly well. They can see a five centimeter little disc of meat from a kilometer in the sky. They can see vultures plummeting from about three to five kilometers. So that's about two to three miles that they can see other vultures plummeting. And that effect has a, has a chain reaction. If one vulture starts heading in a certain direction and then another vulture starts heading in a certain direction, all the vultures that spread out far and wide see this kind of movement into a general area. And then all the vultures start heading in to that area. And as they get into the area, because they can fly, it's quite easy to kind of do a loop around and see what the commotion's all about. So they all would have seen this kudu here, a lot of meat, probably a little bit more difficult to see the leopard. But once they've landed, had a look around, realized that this leopard knows what's going on, realized that this leopard is not going to give up the kill, they thought, well, it's probably time to move off and try their luck elsewhere. So they can travel very quickly, very, very long distances in order to assess a kill, but it's not uncommon common for them to leave, possibly return another day, maybe return tomorrow, knowing that there may be some scraps here, but to wait probably a long, long time wouldn't have made sense for the vultures. There may be one or two lurking about, but I haven't seen any, not one other than the one we saw flying past as we started out. But what I may predict is that a battalure eagle or a hooded vulture may swoop down this afternoon. Those are kind of the, the, the most effective in terms of quick flights in and out the other vultures are more long distance travelers and are less prone to kind of pop in for a quick look and then leave so the smallest vulture the hooded vulture as well as a carrion eating eating eagle called the battalier are going to be the most two likely kind of carrion eaters that we will see here this afternoon James Taylor in Virginia. And James raises a sad but important topic, and that is the topic of vultures being poisoned. Now, sadly, in Africa, a lot of uh, the local people have got very strong beliefs about traditional medicines, and a lot of wild animals are regarded as the most effective of these medicines, vultures being one of them. And traditional doctors will therefore try their best to get as much vulture as they can different parts of vulture some probably the eyes will be used to help people with eye problems it's often very often a direct uh, kind of relation between an animal's strengths like a vulture's eyesight and the human's disability having bad eyes so anyway the vultures are sought after for medicine and are poisoned thankfully not on juma and not on Arethusa. This area is very well patrolled by anti-poachers and the animals here are protected with a very high degree. Surrounding areas, it could still be a problem. I did hear a horrible story quite recently of a number of vultures being poisoned not too far away, um, often by farmers who are none the wiser. Um, but it is, it, it is something, James Taylor, that is not happening as commonly as it was before. And I think the world over, people are becoming more conservation friendly and more conservation conscious. So we are heading in the right direction, I think, as a majority. It's just we need to make sure the minority that's pulling us back and causing trouble for the animals start getting educated on what is right and what is wrong. Hello to Zimbo, and apologies to hear that you are nursing a broken wrist over in London, but very happy to hear that you are on safari with us, and what a good way to mend a broken wrist whilst being on safari. Perfect. Now, you have heard that vultures cannot break into a carcass. They will need to rely on other predators to do so, and uh, it is true to a degree but the leopard-faced vulture that we spoke about a little bit earlier is the individual who will be capable of breaking into carcasses and opening them up 
four other animals. Another thing to remember, Zimba, it obviously depends what kind of carcass. If it is a rhino or an elephant, it's unlikely that even the leopard-faced vulture would be able to open it up. But for smaller animals and your regular kind of herbivores, like a kudu with skin that's thick, but not too thick, this is the tool that will be used when no other carnivores are around. It's a massive, massive beak attached to a massive, massive bird. It's about a 12 pound bird, about a meter in height. And the interesting thing is these vultures are often the ones that actually try and eat the skin, the tendons and the ligaments that are too tough for the other vultures and seldom actually takes the meat. So their primary role is actually opening up the carcass and then these smaller vultures will be the ones that come in afterwards. We don't see the cape vulture nearly as often as I would like, but it's got a bright yellow eye. So that's one we could see. The white back vulture and the hooded vulture And those are the most likely to see here. And that's interesting because there was a second part to Zimbo's question and she was interested to know will certain vultures target specific parts of the kill? And I've already started answering that with the lapid-faced vultures, Zimbo. Yes, they will feed on the skin, the ligaments, the tendons, not so much the meat. The cape vulture and white-backed vulture will be the ones that are going to be feeding on the majority of the meat. And the hooded vulture, he's got a tiny little beak and perfect for kind of getting into all those gaps. Also a much smaller head than the other birds and a smaller body. It can then kind of pick off all the meat between the ribs and all the little tiny little tidbits that are left over. So they each have their little hierarchical spots and that makes the most sense in being effective in cleaning up these carcasses quickly and efficiently. So they've all got their little rolls. There's the white-headed vulture, which I for forgot at the bottom here. So let's just show it to you. That would be rude if we forgot the white-headed vulture off the list. And we actually, I managed to show you the first one just yesterday or the day before that I've managed to see on Safari Live flying past. Also very big, but not quite as big as the lapid face vulture. And interestingly enough, they do quite a lot of hunting and will kill small animals more so than other vultures. But certainly, like the whole family, they are professionals at finishing off leftovers of other animals. Good. Thank you for that question, Zimbo. I hope your wrist heals soon. Now you have got a better idea of how lucky we were to start off the safari within minutes, a minute probably, of arriving. He was up on the move and feeding on that kudu, pulling it around. If some of you missed that, apologies, but next time you should be on time and be here punctually for the start of the safari, otherwise you may miss such things. But now we sit and wait, and a tricky thing, I'm almost thinking it may be worth going for a drive around. Not right now necessarily, but it may be worth heading off and seeing if we can find anything else and coming here when it does cool down. Because my predictions at this stage is that he is not going to be doing too much other than relaxing in the shade. to Joanne on email and Joanne is interested to know on average is a male leopard bigger than an adult female hyena and yes I would say that most often in this area you will find a big male leopard oh thank you for proving me wrong this is what animals do best I said he's probably not going to do anything and all of a sudden he gets up so that's perfect we are happy with this and love to see big cats on the move
So, Joanne, yeah, male leopards will always be slightly bigger in this area than female hyena, but it will vary from time to time. And every animal out here has got slightly different sizes, slightly different personalities to the next one. But what's interesting about that is even though they are slightly bigger than the female hyena, they will still not risk an encounter with them. And why would you? You've got no medical aid out here. The risk of an injury from an animal that has the most powerful jaws in the business doesn't really make sense. And most often, wild animals will avoid fights at all costs. Probably a lesson us as humans could learn. I think we're more, far more violent as a species than most animals. But Joanne, to be honest, just one last thing. The trickiest thing about your question is that I've never weighed a hyena and I've never weighed a leopard. And specifically in this area, it would no, be no good to weigh a leopard in Kenya and a hyena in Cape Town because animals in different areas of Africa will have different sizes. So it's very tricky to know the exact weights of the animals in this area. Hello everybody. How are you doing? Yourself, very good, thanks. That was very interesting listening to you. Well, I'm glad you're finding it interesting. I'm sorry for the parts that are not. <laughs> so we're just chatting with the vehicle that's next to us. They've squeezed into a better spot. They didn't have the best view initially, and I'm actually thinking of possibly trying to move out of our spot so that we can give them a chance to have a view of his face because imagine coming all the way to Africa and only seeing a leopard's tail. It would be a bit disappointing. Okay, well that's perfect. We're gonna send you across to James for an update. I'm gonna reposition and let Tax get his guests a better view and we'll catch up a little bit later. Right, so we've come to another waterhole now. Well, we're on our way to another waterhole. And while we go there, what we're going to do is give you another aerial view. Uh, while Scott, of course, is sitting with the highlight of Juma at the moment, quarantine, we're going to do a few experimental things and show you a few things from the air. Now, this is particularly important for our newer viewers who perhaps don't have an idea of the lay of the land quite like uh, some of the more regular ones. And so I hope you enjoy these aerial shots. We're driving towards a dam called Treehouse Dam at the moment and what you're going to notice is well first of all you'll see us driving along we'll give you a bit of a wave there and then you're also going to see a number of game paths or very obvious paths worn by animals as they move towards uh, treehouse dam and what used to be a very important part of the water balance of this area now I'm always amazed again from the air to see how many of these paths there are. They're worn by all sorts of animals, from impala to elephant to rhino to hippo to uh, buffalo and warthog and everything else that needs the water. And you can see them all converging on Treehouse Dam now. And you can probably also see a little bit in the way of the mud there at Treehouse Dam. That's the last sort of mud that there is there. And again, this dam went completely dry at one stage. There's little bits of rain, still seem to manage to fill up the bits of sort of mud at the end. And now you're going to see us as we come through the trees. Uh, voila! There we are. The drone commander is flying like a Spitfire pilot during the war. I can't actually see him because he's flying straight with the sun. He's very clever. So we're going to stop here on the dam wall, give you another wave, uh, rock and roll style. And not a lot going on here, you can see. Uh, there are a few impala around. They probably had a little bit of a drink. They may have tried to drink out of this muddy water. I suspect what they were doing, though, was eating a little bit of the sort of greenery that's come up amongst the clay here. And there's a bit of grass. There are a few sort of odd plants and bits and pieces. Uh, that the impala will eat. So just amazing to see how little water there is, but 
of course, as I think Scott explained this morning, lots and lots of water around the place if you happen to be, um, well, if you happen to be on some of the other reserves. There are many dams that are pumped by people, and that, of course, changes the entire species composition of an area. So perhaps very different species composition from what it was, say, 300 years ago. That's still a wonderful place to be. All right, so given that there is only one laughing dove standing here at uh, Treehouse Dam, I don't think we're going to linger for long. Let us press on and see what else we can see. It is a rather magnificent afternoon. Like I was saying, not too hot, but cooler than we're used to at this time of the year. I'm never going to complain about that. Uh, it can get very beastly hot, as I said. And what you're going to see us doing now from the air is we're going to turn to the west towards the, well, not quite setting sun yet, but should we say dipping the sun as it heads towards the horizon. And the idea is now to head towards the very western edge of the reserve and maybe get a little update from Arethusa and see what's going on there. And then as the sun does set, we're going to head towards the hyena den and try and figure out what on earth is going on there. So we had a wonderful picture sent through today from the Twitter verse, and I forget unfortunately the name, but a brilliant picture of, because I was going on and on today about the fact that uh, at the hyena den, the twins, the, the twin hyenas that we found at the Philemon's dip uh, den the other day, I said one of them has been killed obviously because there's only one left there. Now Inga then sent through a picture of two baby cubs, one from yesterday and one from today, and they certainly look very different. It is possible that that's the angle, and uh, one of them certainly had her face screwed up. Uh, it's possible it's the angle, but it is also possible that I'm wrong, and that both those twins are at the den there, and only one of them was out today. So we're going to go back there when it cools down a bit, and we'll go and see what's happening. I hope, I really hope that that seven-week-old cub will come out unlike she did this morning. She was just so scared to come out today. So fascinating to find out what's going on there. And Debbie, <laughs> Debbie, we didn't hang around at the den later today. And just remember, a hyena uh, is closely related to a cat and therefore is a cub, not a pup. And Debbie, you want to know, did we wait? We didn't wait around there. So I'm not sure what happened to the seven week old if she did come out and eventually have a bit of a suckle for their mother. I suspect eventually she would have. Uh, but we'll go and find out what's happening there a little bit later. Keep, keep watching and please keep sending through your ideas as to what's going on there. Wonderful to have that picture from, from Inga. Now you're back in the sky. I actually can't see the drone at this stage. Uh, it, may be, it may be filming the Drakensberg for all I know. Um, but a wonderful long range view apparently that you have now of us driving along up towards Philemon's cut line. And I think also quite nice for you to see the different, the road network. It's quite a, Asabi Sands is renowned for the sort of density of the roads that it has and that makes sort of one of the things that makes the game viewing so good. You can also see our southern boundary there, which is called the Gari Main Road. And that's that big main road that you can see probably on the left, I'm guessing on the left hand side of your screen. And and it's gone it's gone on a shot now apparently. It was on the left hand side of your screen I think. And that's our southern boundary. And so important that you can see, if you are a new view viewer, um, you will be able to see that there are no fences bounding us. So those roads are boundaries that we can't cross, but the animals are free to come and go as they please. And that's just the most wonderful thing. So we sit in a contiguous wildlife area of about 8 million acres, or 3.5 million hectares, which is a giant piece of land, three times the size of Yellowstone National Park, about the same size, bigger than Israel, actually. It's an enormous piece of land that we are very privileged to call home. There you see us driving underneath the drone. And dear, 
a very interesting comment you've made on the drone. Dear, you say you wonder if birds of prey would go after the drone. Now, the drone commander is not known for his uh, reticence or his uh, sort of caution. So he has followed a number of birds of prey with that drone, one of the first of which was a batalier. And it was interesting to watch. The batalier did keep looking over his shoulder at the drone, but didn't seem to react too badly. He just tried to sort of get away from it. And there was definitely no attempt to try and attack the drone. But that said, I wouldn't get too close to a martial eagle or something like that, uh, sort of a bird, or especially maybe an African hawk eagle that was uh, about, you know, that are used to catching birds on the wing or an animal that's, you know, Battalier tends to be more of a scavenger. So I wouldn't go after an eagle or bird of prey that was used to catching things in the air, mainly because I think the bird would probably hurt itself. You know, those, those rotors do whip around quite fast. So Andrew's quite careful of that. And then he did, he was up amongst this incredible, and I'm sure you'll post this soon, this incredible array of vultures soaring above around where quarantine is today. And he put the drone in the middle of them. And it's the most incredible picture. Thank you, James Chapman. I'm glad you're back on YouTube. Uh, it's going well, thank you, and uh, I hope it's going well with you. Let's head back to quarantine with Scott, and we'll keep driving along here, see what other interesting bits and pieces we can find. See you later. Well, very happy to hear that one of our new viewers who discovered these live safaris this morning has joined in again, James Chaplin. And isn't this a pleasant surprise for you? Day one on Safari Live, and you've already met Mr. Q, a very well-known leopard amongst the Safari Live family. And I really love these shots when there's a few kind of dappled foliage in the way. Andreen, I cannot fault your thought process. Andreen says she doesn't like the sound of Mr. Q. She prefers the sound of Master Q. And we can try and change over to that. But as always, everybody's going to have a slightly different name or variation thereof for these animals. It's throughout the industry. Everybody likes to tweak the names. But I like your thoughts there, Andreen. And you're right. He certainly has filled out since we last saw him. I can't remember when last I did actually see him. And it would be wonderful if we can actually somehow in the future be able to understand the weights of these animals without actually physically having to dart them and or weigh them. Because it would be great to monitor their weights as they grow up. Now. I would like to show you something, some pictures from this morning. And it may be a little bit hard for you to for some of you to see. It is pictures of him dragging away the fetus of the kudu, but I'm sure a lot of you may find this interesting. So, if you're not interested in watching, turn your heads temporarily. It's nothing too graphic, but there is a little baby kudu with its floppy ears being dra dragged off by Mr. Q, Master Q, sorry, Andreen. And, oh, those aren't going to be too good for you. Sorry about that. But, yeah, that was this morning. And just thought we'd give you a quick glimpse of what was happening earlier on. Very good. I've been waiting for this question to come through, so well done to Mark in Cape Town for being the one who asked it. And it is, do I think he intentionally dragged the kudu fetus further away, knowing that if any other predators come into this area, 
they too could find it and then steal it and by moving it away from the crime scene it means he's got a better chance of running off if lions or hyena come and then being left alone in peace while he finishes that off and mark you're spot on that's exactly what he was doing and it's showing great skill for a relatively young and inexperienced leopard he's only really been fully independent let's say for the last year now i must be careful with these stats because he was fending for himself when i arrived a year ago but he was still within his mother's territory so he was kind of living at home but he had a waitering job that was keeping him going but still getting looked after a lot by his mother and still stealing a lot of her kills so when he couldn't catch something he would just run around until eventually he would find mom and he would overpower her and even though she would hiss and snarl at him he would be able to eat his delight or eat his content and then move off now that has changed probably from about march or april this year we started seeing less and less of him and probably since then we've only seen him a handful of times he's moved further to the south and to the east of us and in that time that he's been gone he's been fine-tuning the skills of hunting and not only catching the prey but dealing with it once it has been caught and i think this is a good example of that kind of skill and wisdom that comes with time move part a portion of the kill away and then come back to the main part that cannot be moved any further so good move mr q questions coming through on the topic of the kudu fetus penny pine and ellen fowler are interested to know whether i think the kudu was giving birth when mr q latched onto her or was she going to give birth in a few days time and i'm under the impression that she was still probably going to give birth only in a few days time and the reason why i think that is because oh, it's difficult i don't know i've just got that gut feeling that that is what happened um but maybe i'm wrong it's so hard to tell i mean the only portions of the carcass that had been fed on when we arrived here was basically what you saw earlier on the one rib cage being opened up and a tiny bit of the rump around the tail being chewed on other than that it's so with just that information, it's very difficult to work out whether it was in the process of giving birth or... It certainly hadn't given birth yet. That baby kudu had not been born. Maybe some of its legs were poking out of the rear end of the female, but I do not think it had been actually born just yet. And that's just my gut feel. We are going to have to ask Mother Nature for any further details sadly ellen and penny pine sorry i cannot do it more of more assistance there well donna's interested to know why has this leopard not removed the stomach contents of this kudu yet and will it because donna knows that lions will do that and it certainly will donna it's just that it's got time well it doesn't have time on its side but it doesn't have competition of other pride members and help of other pride members to chew through all that kudu so it's fed on as much as it can and when it gets to the point where it needs to remove those stomach contents to access more meat oh big yawn um you may do another one so be ready with your screenshots they tend to let them off in kind of verse sort of two and three um may well i've just lost my train of thought completely here so we'll just sit in silence while i try and work out what it was i was saying apologies
Well, it seems like Robert and myself have got similar tastes when it comes to looking at these beasts and enjoys having the kind of blurry foreground with the piercing eyes poking through. Interestingly enough, VM mentioned, who's on camera with me this afternoon, that this is a very contrasty leopard, meaning that the markings are very bold and there is a very large contrast to him compared to others. And I couldn't agree more with VM. So that probably adds to the effect of the sighting. Panting away, lacking the ability to sweat like I am at the moment, which I'm quite happy to be doing. I'm quite happy to be sweating as opposed to panting, as I'm sure a lot of you are. I imagine if you had to listen to me panting all afternoon, Archer, that wouldn't be much fun. But some of you may have just heard me take a sip of my water with a massive ice block in the middle of the bottle. Hello to Sharon in Pittsburgh, one of our regular viewers. And she would like to know, when will the leopard's dewlap start developing? And a dewlap is a kind of extra flap of skin that will hang below the throat and neck and even stomach of a big male leopard and anywhere from five to seven years of age but it does get bigger and more pronounced the older they get but certainly like i say for me five to seven is the age where leopards really come into their prime some slightly younger than others just like humans woodlands kingfishers Chick Calling around us, a Cape turtle dove as well. question through from Kevin on YouTube and that is <clears throat> one thing that I hope may happen let me just ask uh, relay Kevin's question first though Kevin is interested to know that if hyena or lion come into this area what will this male leopard do will he run off knowing that they'll probably consume everything or will he lurk around and try and poach a few tidbits and leopards are very cunning animals, Kevin, and they are highly, highly likely to try and stick around and sneak the odd little bits from a carcass. And what often does happen is that hyenas will come and get so caught up in fighting with one another that they'll leave one, one of the kudu's legs uh, at one side of the crime scene and the leopard will run in, poach it, and run away up a tree. So there certainly are ways of animals like leopards being able to get portions of their kill back. What could also happen is that a hyena could come in, and I've actually had an incredible sighting with the same leopard. He had caught a large nyala at Buffalo's Quarterhole, where you were with James a little bit earlier, and he was busy feeding on it when a hyena came running into the scene. He got up, left the hyena to feed on it, and he was lying probably three or four meters away from the hyena, close, lying down patiently. Not a worry in the world. The hyena was eating, the leopard didn't put up a fight, the hyena's happy, the leopard was happy, there was enough meat for everyone. Another hyena then came in. Those two hyenas started squabbling over the, the remains of the anyala, and the one hyena, the hyena that was first there, started pulling the anyala backwards towards quarantine male, who eventually like kind of had to get up and be like, I don't want to get involved in your trouble, yeah? Eventually, the two hyena left, quarantine came back, and continued feeding. So these strange things do happen here. I have seen footage of a hyena feeding on one end of a carcass and a male leopard feeding on another.
So simultaneously. So bizarre things do happen, but leopards will stick around. They definitely will. Those of you will remember the uh, two Nat Geo shows we did live to TV in October when Peter Pretorius was lucky enough to be on site with Shadow and an impala that was literally still kicking. Shadow, a female leopard, was busy suffocating her. Two hyena came in, started feeding on it. Other hyena came. They got a bit confused with one another. The hyena went off. Shadow came in, got some more meat, ran off. The hyena got the, the majority of the meat, but she definitely did get some back. Another interesting story, one more, and that involves this leopard's brother called Kunyuma. And there was a coalition of two big male lions here on Juma who killed a Cape buffalo very large prey about one and a half tons of uh, one, uh, 1500 pounds of meat rather not a one and a half ton buffalo that would be scary um one and a half thousand pounds of meat <laughs> um anyway the two male lions had caught the buffalo kunyuma this leopard's brother was nearby we had seen him nearby that night and when i found the buffalo with the lion in the morning, I asked myself, did that leopard hear the buffalo being killed and is he lurking nearby? It's not uncommon for these young males, or any leopard really, to even sneak into a pride of lion's kill to steal some meat. I've seen it happen before and the same thing happened with his brother. He lurked around this buffalo carcass. We didn't get any confirmed footage of him stealing anything while they fed on it for about two days. But once they finished that Cape buffalo, Kunyuma was straight in there literally seconds after they disappeared and he was chewing on the hoof of a buffalo up in a tree above us. So they will certainly sneak about and they know they are masters of disguise and disappearing and they back themselves. So clever animals, the leopards, and they will take chances from time to time, especially with sniping a piece of meat. Mauricia and Texas and Christina are both interested to know about when he may start looking for girlfriends. And in and around that five to seven year old mark is when they come into their own. And it's unlikely that he would mate before then, but there is a chance he would. And that's not to say that he's incapable of mating now, but it's just in, in typical kind of leopard life, He's probably only going to be allowed to learn the challenges of mating and learn how to mate when he does get to that age. If we put him and a female leopard in a box right now for the next three months, there's a strong chance that they would work out how to mate sooner than he naturally would in the wild. But that is in an unnatural scenario. So where mother nature is in control, Anywhere between five and seven would be your likely mating age. Okay, well, we've got some good news. James has been out searching tirelessly for some other animals and has finally found a beautiful big specimen for you. Everybody. We're just watching a big, magnificent elephant bull here. We are looking at him from the sky as well. And I'm not going to look at you. I'm going to just watch this elephant carefully. He is watching us quite carefully, and he has been watching us as we drove in here. You can unquestionably hear the drone above him. Whether he associates that with us or not, I'm not sure. And here he comes a little bit closer. So we're just going to sit here very carefully and quietly and just try and assess his behavior. Remember, the crucial, crucial part of everything we do here is maintaining the trust of the animals here. And we do try different things, like with the drone, and once, you know, it took a while for them to get used to the vehicles, and now we're trying to get them used to things like that drone. 
And so we very cautiously, very quietly, just try and sort of introduce new things to the animals. And with a big bull like this, well, you don't want to irritate him too much. This is six tons of gentle giant, but very quickly becomes six tons of very angry fury if you irritate him on the wrong day. So we're now sitting about 30 meters from him, 20 meters from him. Now, while we watch this elephant, which is com in complete contrast to the leopard that you've just been watching. Safari, do you want to know what percentage of the time the animals spend relaxing? Uh, you couldn't get two more different examples. Leopards and lions will sleep for mm, almost 80%, 80 to 90% of the time. They will be doing absolutely nothing. This elephant, to maintain his body weight, however, probably only sleeps for three or four hours of the day, and often that's just a quick doze in the shade before he moves on and keeps eating. So, Safari D, not a lot of time spent sleeping if you happen to be a herbivore, especially an enormous one like this. Very good question. The herbivores in general will relax far less than the carnivores, and that's because their food isn't quite as rich and their real sort of um, the nutrient that they or macronutrient that they lack the most from their food is protein. Protein is difficult to get just from the plants that we have out here and obviously that's not a problem for the cats. The cats on the other hand only eat protein, very lean meat, very little fat and that means to can make energy, to make the kind of uh, sugars and glucose needed to make the body go um, function, it's expensive. To digest protein and create energy from it is expensive. You can do it with fat a lot more easily, but there's very little fat on any of the savannah animals that we have out here. your very, very kind comment. Well, I think it's kind. You say that you feel like you're going to school every day. Um, it's not a feeling I would relish, I must confess, but um, I think you mean that you're learning a lot every day. Cat, you know, we learn probably as much as you do every day. I'm just going to sit very quietly. He's coming, he's investigating us, he's looking at us quite carefully. He's definitely watching us. And I think there's a certain amount of inquisitiveness, curiosity amongst these elephant bulls. You know, they spend the day alone eating, and when they have a little bit of entertainment in the form of uh, us sitting watching them, I think they quite enjoy it sometimes. There we go. Isn't you lovely? And Ashley, you sent through an update that you saw an elephant bull on Juma Dam Cam, and he was uh, having a mud bath, and you wonder if it couldn't, might be the same one. Ashley, I'd say more than likely, yes, the same bull. We're quite close to the Juma Dam Cam, so probably the same bull there. You can see his incredibly dexterous trunk. They've been eating those trees. It looks like a... Uh, it looked like a weeping wattle tree there, or the remnants thereof. I've certainly been eating a lot of those of late. Isn't he lovely? I'm just going to let him walk out onto the clearing so that we can go around him without him coming back into this thick bush. I think it's going to be well worth spending a bit of time with this old bull. What have got there? There's a rock there at his feet. Watch this, watch this. <laughs> now, I tell you why I find this so fascinating is that 
I've so often driven, or I used to drive along roads in these reserves, and you find a big rock in the middle of the road, and you think, how on earth did that get there? And I remember then watching an elephant bull like this one day, picking the rock up gently and placing it in the middle of the road. You can see there that he took a little bit of entertainment from that rock. I don't know what kind of block that is. It looks like it's possibly not um, naturally made. It wasn't made by the environment out here. I'm not sure what it is. We'll go and have a look once he's moved off. And there's no, there's no question he's watching us right now. So Janet, very nice comment from you. You're in Baltimore, and really nice to hear you from you all the way from them. Yes, it's pretty chilly there at the moment. Um, you say you watched a Nat Geo show the other day, and they told you that an elephant bull will eat its own body weight in 20 days. Well, this elephant probably weighs about mm, six tons. Uh, I would have said that they ate about, he would eat about 250 kilograms a day. So in 20 days, that would put him at about five tons of food, 5,000 kilograms. So yes, I suppose they do. Uh, about 20 days to eat their own body weight. I was wondering how much we eat in a day, how much food we eat, maybe about three kilograms. In 20 days, you yeah, know, it's not too far off our own body weight, you know. He's fascinated by us. He's having a very good look. And he's also going to play with his pet rock. And just look how that trunk has that incredible array of what concertina muscles, so you can stretch it out and then retract it, just like a sort of concertina. Now he's definitely saying to us, I'm watching you. See how he's lifted his ears out there? Sometimes these bulls can get a little bit, well, I don't like to use the word aggressive. Um, they can get a little bit uh, irritated, and then they can kind of take a chance and uh, maybe come and sort of investigate and be a bit bullysome. Well, I don't think he's going to do that. But there's no reason for him to be where he is now other than to watch us. See, he's not eating, he's pretending to eat. He's just picking the old bit of grass and then blowing it up. You can see him standing there underneath the marula tree. Huge marula tree, which will start to fruit uh, fairly soon. Unless it's a male, in which case it will never fruit. It does look like a male. I don't think it's got any fruits on it at all. Isn't he great? Even pretending to feed, it's called a displacement behavior. So he's feeling a little bit awkward, obviously, just enjoying himself, but wanting to make out that he's, yeah, he's not affected, he's not watching us. tree, a little leadwood tree, and there you can see the hair in his tail. Well, while we're looking at this elephant uh, as he stands in the sun, Randall, you want to know, you're uh, talking to us from YouTube, the YouTube stream, you want to know if South Africa has cold winters. Randall, it depends entirely on where you are in South Africa. Some parts of South Africa have pretty cold winters. You know, the coldest area in the country is a place called Sutherland, and that will drop probably to minus 10 fairly regularly during the year, and going up to a maximum in the middle of the day of probably around 10 degrees Celsius. So that's all in Celsius. 
and then in this area it doesn't get cold it gets to about four degrees celsius which is pretty chilly but in the middle of the day normally 22 or 23 degrees celsius in the middle of winter so very pleasant mild winters that we have out here all right there's our elephant bull i'm going to spend a little bit more time with him but while we do while i do that uh, and we let's send you back to the leopard and quarant uh, and scott you know, quarantine is the leopard scott is not the leopard uh, enjoy it and we'll see you a little bit later so other than us repositioning the vehicle not too much has changed here mr q is still panting away and it is still very hot i believe you have been torturing with james torturing james with chats of cold winters and wouldn't that be nice to be in a nice cold place now you know, there's many south africans that have never seen snow i saw snow for the first time when i was 21 years of age and it required me to travel across to aspen in colorado not a bad place to start my snowy debut Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could track leopards through the snow? And there are snow leopards, so maybe one day we will take you on a snow leopard safari live adventure. It's certainly worth keeping all these dreams alive because there are many places we can go on safari, not just here on the Sabi Sands, not just elsewhere in Africa, but the entire planet has got some incredible places and incredible wildernesses and incredible animals that live within them that I certainly would like to see before it's too late, either for me or for the animals. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm giggling because one of our long-standing viewers and leopard identification experts, Raisa, has just joined in onto the show. And hello, Raisa. Because of all of your hard work and commitment to Safari Live, we have no problem with updating you on what has happened, even though you have tuned in late. And don't worry about asking to do that in the future again. Basically, Raisa, what happened was we came out on drive this morning at about 10 o'clock between drives, and we found some vultures circling in this area, or actually plummeting out of the sky. Drove in off Cheetah Cut Line, and we kind of between Cheetah Cut Line and Ledwood Road, so in the southeastern corner of Juma. And what we did was drove in, found the vultures, couldn't see any kill or predator initially, took a very short and slow walk around until eventually I saw the kudu, and I saw Q lying nearby. We then came in with the vehicle and saw Q drag a fetus off down into the riverbed, and then came back here he returned to this kill to make sure the vultures didn't steal any of it. The vultures have all left. He's had a small snack on the kudu at the start of the safari and hasn't touched anything yet. So we did get lucky early on because I certainly wasn't expecting him to move during that hot first part of the, the safari. And now he's relaxing, right? So good to know you are with us. And apologies for whatever delayed you getting on safari. Joey, who's just eight years old, has stumped me, and it's often the younger children who ask the most difficult questions. Joey would like to know how many teeth does a leopard have in its mouth? And I actually don't know, Joey, but I would guess that it's got about five or six in the front, another five down each side, so I'd say 15 on each jaw. I would say about 30 teeth in that mouth. But... And I'm a little bit off. There's 32, I'm told. Nikki, thankfully, did some quick research for me in the final control room. And they have 32 teeth, four of which are those long, sharp canines. So there we go, Jay. 32 teeth. And four of which are the very sharp ones that you can see every now and then. Oh, there we go. Now we can see them now that he's panting. <laughs> 